We're now going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the connection between our food systems here on Earth and outer space with a conversation about the search for life in the universe. I'm really excited about this. So joining me for this conversation, we have Dr. Gary Blackwood, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory Program Manager at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. That's a mouthful. <laughs> and Dr. Carmen Blackwood, the founder and CEO of Earthrise LLC. Big round of applause for them. So before we dive in, I have to tell you that my co-founder, Bernard Pollock, I'll point him out in the back of the room, has a, has a huge interest in, in what we're about to talk about. Um, in, in 2021, you know, height of pan, the pandemic, he took a musical to Fringe called We Came to Dance uh, that was commissioned at the UN Climate Change Conference that year in Glasgow. And that, that musical tells the story of aliens who travel from an exoplanet to warn Earth, to warn us of what can happen if we don't change course. So I'm gonna give him a round of applause. He's super creative. Um, so, so Gary and Carmen, I, I, I can't wait to dig in. This is gonna be fun. This is very different for me, right? This is not my usual area. <laughs> so um, some folks in the audience might be wondering how research in space is, con is connected to our food system. So I'm hoping we can talk about that first. And I know they, they have slides, everyone, slides. So <laughs> please go ahead and, and tell me what the connection is. Well, thanks, Danny. Um, um, uh, in my career at NASA exploring the universe, I've come to appreciate how special this planet is. And what we're excited to do today, and we'll try to do today, is convince you and your audience how NASA space science and the search for life in the universe is actually very related to <laughs> food systems on Earth. Yes, and uh, so I look at Earth from space, and you talked about the interconnectedness in the first talk, how everything's interconnected, and uh, now with uh, what we're doing in, in Earth science and climate science, we're realizing more and more the importance of this interconnectedness within the systems. and. You know, food systems play an integral role uh, on our planet, and um, by looking at it from space, we can see how it's impacted by the environment, but also impacting the environment, and bring us to an imagination of what future Earth could look like. I love that, a future imagination of what would Earth could look like. Can I ask everyone in the room, I, I know you all want to have discussions, there's plenty of time for that, but if you could just keep the, the volume in the room down a little, that would be great and helpful to our sound folks who are amazing. So the, the, this conversation is obviously focused on the exoplanets, but can you explain what they are for, for people who may not be familiar? What is an exoplanet? And our slides up on, on the screen behind us, thank you. Uh, sure, well thanks for asking. What's an exoplanet? Basically it's a planet that orbits another star. Right? We all grew up and, and learned about the planets in our <laughs> solar system, Mercury, Venus, uh, Jupiter, etc. Uh, and uh, uh, that's all we knew for uh, millennia. But our sun is a star. Every star is a sun. Our sun has planets. Why shouldn't other stars have planets? I mean, where did Captain Kirk take the Enterprise? <laughs> Texoplanets. So scientists have discovered thousands of planets around other stars by looking at a tiny fraction of the galaxy. And by extrapolation, they now know that there are more planets than stars in the galaxy. Not everybody knows this. This is not well accepted, but it's true. And when you look at the night sky, on the clearest night, you might see 6,000. In our galaxy, there will be over 100 billion. And when we look at an artist's concept of the galaxy, from imaginary place outside of the disk. Our sun is in the suburbs of the galaxy, <laughs> and we show here uh, with these stars, those planets uh, found around other stars, a tiny fraction uh, of our galaxy. This is just where we looked. But they are so far away. The distances are so great. Light years, one light year is six trillion miles. That's a six with 12 zeros. That's a pretty big number, and those are the closer ones. So we're not going there anytime soon unless one of you invents the warp drive. So for, till then, 
our artists actually imagine travel to these planets. This is the Exoplanet Travel Bureau. This is produced by the same people who built that message in a bottle on the Europa Clipper that was at South by Southwest earlier in the week. It's the same, it's the same group. They imagined travel to a world with two suns, real planet, Kepler-16b. Kepler-16 is the name of the star, b is the planet. That's the land with two suns. That's the Tatooine world, right? Real planet, real star. There's stars around, small, dim, red uh, stars. That's, those are the ones you hear mostly about in the news. And we actually found planets that don't orbit any stars. They are drifting throughout the galaxy, kicked out of their solar system, drifting through space under their heat. And so the planets that we're finding are all over the galaxy, all kinds of strange solar systems that don't resemble our solar system at all, planets smaller, larger. In fact, the most common planet in the galaxy appears to be between the size of Earth and Neptune. What's on that planet? We call them super-Earths or mini-Neptunes. Kind of an interesting place. So this is all part, Danny, of NASA's search for life in the galaxy, which I will try to persuade you, we will, is tied to food systems on Earth. We have a little bit more to go on that. We will get to that, I promise. I, I do want to know, so this process of NASA find, like finding other planets, like what does that look like? Can you, can you tell me what that looks like and why it's... Well, sure, in a, in a word, um, astronomers all over the world do this, not, not just NASA. NASA has telescopes in space for this, but on the ground and in space, um, one um, looks for the indications of the planets. The, the planets are tiny. They're uh, essentially invisible, but we can often see their effect on their star. If you look at a star and the star is wobbling, that's because a planet is going around it. Mm -hmm. Or we can look at a star and it dims slightly. That's because a star, a planet, passes in front of it. And so those are the two common Signs. ways. <laughs> Signs, yeah. Shadows and wobbles, pretty much. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I do want to talk now about how exoplanets relate to food and agriculture and what that means for all of us on Earth. Okay, so uh, we'll just, uh, here's the transition. This, uh, NASA is now building a tel uh, designing a telescope called the Habitable World Observer, the first one that will actually look for signs of life on planets outside the solar system. This telescope will look for planets in the habitable zone, like people probably know what this is, right? The Goldilocks zone, not too hot like Venus, not too cold like Mars, just right for water, just right for life. So we're looking for planets that could host liquid water. We think nature will favor water. We think nature will favor carbon-based systems. We think that these will be exoplanetary food systems. And we all know what the habitable zone is, right? We've all gone camping. Where does everybody sit? In the habitable zone. And so this is actually a good analogy for the search. We are building a telescope that will look and block, uh, look, look for a, um, a, a system similar to this, where the, the fire is the, is, the, is the star and the faces are the planets. It, it's like looking for the faces next to the fire, but from across the country. That's how difficult it is. But NASA engineers have figured out how to do this. And when we look at the light on the faces of the planets, we will be able to spread out the light in the colors of a rainbow. And the rainbow will have missing colors, the spectral analysis. And that spectral analysis of a planet will reveal the presence of a biological activity if there are other biological planets. And so here's the Earth spectra showing the rich chemistry of water and carbon dioxide and methane and, uh, and oxygen. These are all the products that the food systems on Earth give away. We interact with our biological planet and that food, our food systems are given away in the signature of the, uh, of the atmosphere. And we can see that from great distances, not just of the Earth, but across light years. Very, very exciting stuff. Carmen, what can we see from, um, from space when we look at Earth? What are we, what are we looking at? Yes, so um, I'm, I'm showing a graphic here. I hope you can see that a, a little bit. So what Gary was talking about is basically the visible light that we see. So it's a, it's a tiny part of the spectrum that uh, we, we have here, but with all the satellites around Earth, we can look at, at other um, spectral properties as well. We can look at microwave and infrared, for example, that we don't see with the naked eye. Now, what 
does that tell us? You know, different uh, surfaces on Earth reflect light in a different way. And, you know, we have measurements that are active. And everybody who drives the car and has gotten a speeding ticket might be familiar with radar. So we use radar from space to measure distances and height changes like sea level, for example. But then also surfaces emit radiation, like plants, for example. The reason why they appear green, green is because they reflect uh, green light. Uh, and then, but also infrared, which we can't see by eye, but we can pick that up with satellites. So we can then see how the planet is evolving over time. You see landscape changes there over time. And, you know, we can look at the whole system and, and how it's interconnected, how, and then that leads us to food systems. And so we can look at What's the land cover like? What's the land use like? Are plants in stress, mm -hmm, actually? What mm -hmm. is the water availability? And what are the soil conditions? Yeah. We can look at soil health and soil moisture, for example. So, so Gary, Carmen talked about how we're evolving, not always for the better here. So I'm wondering what we can learn from those exoplanet food systems, even though they're different and there's different light. And to be honest, I don't get it. But like, <laughs> um, but there's, you know, and, and Bernie has explained it to me and my husband has explained it to me, but I still don't get it. What can we learn from them? Are, are, we, are we turning into an, are, uh, like a, a different kind of exoplanet? Well, that's a great question. And so um, a lot of times we, uh, want to learn about ourselves by studying others. If, yeah. if we're worried about our future um, uh, as a planet, we might look at the analogy of our future as individuals. We might look at our older siblings or our cousins or our parents to see um, where we're coming from. Yeah. Um, it's guiding, but it's not constraining because we have choices. And yeah. so our Earth is um, only about four and a half billion years old. And this mission that NASA <laughs> is designing now will find dozens of Earths around other stars. We think this is now very, uh, very likely. And that uh, we're just realizing now that arguably half of these planets will be older than the Earth. So if we're worrying, wondering about where we're going, we might find out where other planets have gone. And when we look at the Earth, uh, scientists know that the atmosphere of the Earth was very different in the past when you look uh, very far in the past. And we wonder what might the future of Earth look like if life is allowed to evolve for another billion or two billion years and how might that be impacted by a technological civilization like ours or maybe on another planet upon their uh, upon their planet spectrum what do you both hope the audience who's here today and me because i'm clearly very ignorant about a lot of this stuff what do you hope we take away from this discussion well, um, so I think, you know, you mentioned regeneration, regenerative agriculture in the past. I think, you know, there's a lot of ways uh, we, we could go. We can uh, imagine what the future looks like. And there's, you know, just amazing uh, regenerative agriculture work going on across the planet. So then if we think about scaling up the regeneration, you know, how would that look like? How can we imagine that? And uh, where um, do we go in the future? Can we, as currently a technological civilization, be in harmony with our biological planet? Yeah. Gary, do you want to add anything to that? I just hope that um, when we uh, do our search, we'll learn whether we're uh, unique in the universe, or my hope that we're part of a greater cosmic community. But no matter what we learn, we need to take care of this planet because it's our home. Carmen and Gary, you give me so much hope. Thank you both so much. I have one final question for you, and I'm wondering if you can talk about the sky tours that the attendees can at, uh, be at later this evening. Sure, I want to call out Michael Sang. He's in the back somewhere. There's Michael. He's in the front now. And uh, Michael uh, is going to help us uh, tonight with NASA Sky Tours. Fingers crossed for some opening in the weather. Uh, we'll have a laser and telescope uh, look at the sky. And I think we have some material over there in the, in the main room for um, uh, sky calendars. In case it's cloudy tonight, maybe uh, on later night you can take, take the sky calendar out and look at it and see something on the sky. Thank you both so much. Again, a hopeful, wonderful, really informative discussion. Thank you both so much. Round of applause for them, please. Thank you.